Yes, people, and we're live. Welcome to part five, The basically just an overview and, and recap of the great Black Panther, Harry Wills. I'm joined by Joshua City from 86 Boxing. Josh, what's up, brother? Of the great Black Panther. Hey, how's it going, Random? Happy to be here as usual. And we're going to wrap up the career of one of the greatest heavyweights to lace up a pair of gloves in Harry Wills. And this is good stuff. I know that a lot goes into it in terms of taking the time, diving into the research. And it is a good thing overall, and it pays off in the long run as far as being able to chronicle the feats of such great fighters. So this history has a place, and I appreciate you putting on these shows where we can discuss these guys and, and gals, in that case, uh, that date back to well before our time, but had such a major impact that has been lasting in this deep sport. Awesome, brother. Yeah, it's great to have you. And just a good thing for us to celebrate these greats of the past, keep the memory alive, especially now in the internet age when we have access to a lot of information all in one place, easily accessible digitally that wasn't available to the generations that followed Harry Wills. So I've noticed in my research with Sam Langford, you know, as time goes by, as the years go by, the way people relay stories, they get amended over time, whether it's conscious or unconscious. They, And this has happened with Wills and other characters and people's memories are, are, are preserved differently, especially someone like him who was a contender. He was the colored heavyweight champion. But, you know, the way people describe boxing, you know, they act as though there were there was just, you know, Johnson and just Willard and just Dempsey and they were the only champion that really wasn't the case yeah. but the way it was reported over the decades following we can we can actually get a, a very accurate picture in some ways considering how long ago it was of what was actually happening at the time not the way it was remembered by people the way they distilled it down to basically explain it to casuals but uh, I was wondering if you could just to kick this off just maybe talk about just the broad overarching shape of of the career of Harry Wills. We know he started with a pretty tough schedule. Could you just talk about that, like, and how that forged him into the fighter he became? Sure. Yeah, so Harry Wills, as you all know from what we've shared in the previous videos of this series, is without a doubt one of the best heavyweights that we've seen in the sport. And he, much like a lot of the heavyweights from back then, had to be thrown into the fire to say the least, from the very beginning of their career. So a lot of times today we see fighters built up in a way that allows for promoters to pretty much control just how deep a water that these fighters go into early on. So you see a lot of showcase fights where the matchups are all but in favor of the fighter that the promoter is keening on being one that they can make money off of in the future or they can build up in that sense. Uh, and sometimes that's, that doesn't even, sometimes that's irregardless of whether or not they are truly skilled or they have the talent and sort of that drive and vision to become one of those great fighters. So Harry Wills, he's one of these guys who, was just thrown in and you had to fight the toughest available then and there because it was a means for financial stability in addition to um, just a means for you to have an actual trade or, or something that you can work towards. So for Wills in many of the time, once they got a glimpse of the type of funding that they could make in boxing, compared to what they were doing on their regular day jobs or any or if anyone had one prior to them actually becoming a boxer. So once they got wind of that, then they put their focus towards competing in the sport of boxing. And that's essentially what we saw with the likes of Harry Wills. Uh, he, he, he was thrown into the fire, as mentioned. He jumped in early. So he started off pretty decently took a loss to a veteran fighter by, by the name of George Kid Cotton, who was a sparring partner of Jack Johnson. And as we all know, Jack Johnson, first black heavyweight champion of the world. So Kid Cotton, he wasn't anyone with a fancy record or anything of that nature, but he was a fighter. 
and he had that work that was being done with Johnson. This was 1911. So Harry Will started his career in 1911, essentially. But this was 1912 when he actually fought uh, George Kit Cotton. But in 1911, 1912, this, these were points of where Jack Johnson was pretty much on top of his game. You know, so Harry Wills started in the midst of that. And a guy like George Kid Cotton, of course, would learn way more than just the average fighter who isn't competing or sparring with like the heavyweight champion of the world. But you have you have other seasoned fighters who are typically out there in the mix. But this is just one example. And later on, of course, Harry Wills would avenge that loss threefold, uh, I guess you can say. As he just continued, as he just started to just knock out George Kid Cotton as time went on, but essentially, early in, in his career, he was thrown in there between 1911, 1912. He fought Joe Jeanette. And by the time he got to 1914 or 1913 and 1914, uh, yeah, he would he would be in with the likes of Sam McVeigh. He would be in with a number of the other top contenders from that time. You think about uh, thinking about um, Clark. Uh, what's his name is escaping me right now. Uh, oh, Jeff Clark. Jeff Clark. Jeff Clark. So Jeff Clark, another uh, great heavyweight from the time who was a lot like uh, many who didn't really get a shot at a world title or anything of that nature. So, Length or, or Wills at this particular time, early on in his career, as time went on, he would be in the mix with these types of guys, and this would all help to build him up into becoming a fighter that that he ultimately became. And this was at one point the best heavyweight in the world. I think that you'd be hard pressed to find many heavyweights at a particular time when Wills was in his prime that were that were better than him. Of course, the name is Jack Dipsy. That's going to be one that comes up. But uh, Wills was just so far ahead of the competition at one point that he was nearly unstoppable. And, of course, we spoke on the great rivalry he had with Sam Langford and early on in that rivalry, which would have been sort of at the tail end or uh, on the backside of Sam Langford's prime. Uh, he was still very viable. Uh, when they first fought, but certainly not the prime and ripe Sam Langford of the night of 1910, 1911, uh, that time frame, because of course, this was when Wills was just starting. But essentially, he would go into a rivalry with Langford, and early on, Langford would get the better of Wills. And Langford, as we all know, he's he's like a remarkable specimen being 5'7", really probably closer to 5'6 than 5'7 in actuality, but he had long arms, stocky upper chest, uh, and he he was just uh, he, he was just one of those guys who it's almost like a create a character, you know, you, you create a character and give him all of, all of the attributes. It doesn't have to be the biggest guy, it doesn't have to be the strongest guy. But you just dial it up on the attributes, and uh, there you have it with uh, Sam Langford. So he was he was able to handle and give Harry Wills, who was a bigger guy, six foot two, uh, generally in that two hundred and fifteen range, sometimes more. But he was able to give Harry Wills a ton of trouble, and this was as he was sort of on the backside of his prime, I would say, and then eventually for Langford, as Harry Wills started to move into his prime when they fought, even a great Langford could no longer defeat Harry Wills because it was just too much of a task given his size and his ability. And and Wills was great on the inside as well. His uppercut was probably his strong suit, his right uppercut. And in some of the limited footage we do have of him when he's training, practicing, that is something they highlight. Uh, and he's able to get great leverage on him. He's another guy who had long arms, broad chest and shoulders. So he was built different as well. But essentially, this, these are the types of things that help to build Harry Wills up 
And as we moved further into his career, it's like the competition kept going, but Harry Wills kept exceeding. And over a five-year span, he was pretty much the best heavyweight in the world. And we wanted to see him actually put that to the test against Jack Dempsey, who was the guy who was considered to be the other best heavyweight in the world and who had the world heavyweight title. Uh, but that fight never came to tuition, came to fruition, but it was one that was clamored for and one that was truly one of those top pick em type matchups that would have generated a ton of buzz, a buzz even to this day. And I know we've mentioned it in previous episodes where we talk about certain eras. There was always these fights that we never got to see actually happen that would have been likely the best matchups at that particular time, whether that was John L. Sullivan versus the Black Prince Peter Jackson or seeing uh, prime James J. Jeffries taking on Jack Johnson in his prime or something of that nature. Sometimes it's timing. Sometimes it's outside interest, just a multitude of things. But Harry Wills versus Jack Dipsy is another one that fell victim to a fight that just for whatever reason never got made, even though it was talked about and a lot of people were speaking on it. And we have, of course, prime examples of today where we see this happen as well. But undeterred, Harry Wills, he continued to fight even as the Dempsey fight kept eluding him. And he continued to apply his trade. And there are those that knew and had some form of an inkling that he was, in all likelihood, the best heavyweight in the world uh, at the time that his career ran, or his prime ran parallel to that of Jack Dempsey. So just a great matchup we didn't get to see, but certainly one that we can continue to talk about with time as we are doing here today and will continue to do for the considerable future. So uh, that's really kind of a quick high level overview of kind of how Harry Wills came to be, but certainly uh, it's not limited to some of the many things that he did in his uh, career and some of the many great fights and rivalries that he had as well. Yeah, well put, sir. And I think, you know, a lot of the, other than his physical attributes, you know, he's long, lean, but, you know, not a small person at all. And even today, I mean, he'd be a heavyweight today. He wasn't a small guy. Yeah. And he wouldn't be, he wouldn't necessarily, he wouldn't, he wasn't as tall as, say, like a Fury or a Wilder type, but not all the heavyweights today are that size. Those guys are especially tall for today. But Will's a big guy, especially in his time. And, um, you know, he did have the loss to Kid Cotton, but, he, you know, he avenged that several times. He improved on his results. We've talked about other guys like Langford. That is, he would improve on his results sometimes, like with um, Dave Holly and with Larry Temple and other guys. You know, he would get better and better. Langford would be able to figure them out. And he had all this other vast experience. Well, this is kind of what happened with Will's, but he was offset. And I think Wills was born in 1889. So he was only a few years older than Langford, who was born in 86. But Langford started as a professional in his teens in 1902, whereas Wills started in 1911. But he started at as a heavyweight, whereas Langford had started down. I, I've seen him described as a featherweight, but I've only seen results in the papers as a lightweight. The amateur tournament was 135 pounds, which was just over the lightweight limit of the day. But... Uh, as far as the pros, but amateur 135 was, was lightweight. So, um, but Langford starting around in that thing, certainly when he would have started sparring and living in the Lennox athletic club, like Langford would have been a featherweight, but as a pro seems like he started around with lightweight will start as a heavyweight. So he started later in his life. He was a little bit older. I think he was 22. As far as the known fights, you know, you know how it is, Josh, trying to, <laughs> trying to track down all the fights is, yeah. is quite a task. But he ran into, like, right here in, in 14, where he's really coming into his own, right? He draws with Langford, draws with Jeanette. He's beating everyone else till the end of the year. And Langford and um, the great Sam McVeigh had first met in 1911 in Paris in April. And they fought again at the end of the year in Australia, 
first fight went to a draw over 20 rounds. The second fight, McVeigh got the decision, and that snapped a long streak, I think 21 fight streak of Langford's. And in his previous, whatever, 57 or 58, he'd only his only other loss had been a close one to Jim Flynn, who incidentally knocked out Jack Dempsey later, past his prime, knocked out Jack Dempsey. But he, um, but f- people thought Langford carried Flynn. So, like, the, the significance of McVeigh's victory over Langford at the end of the year was huge. But then the next year, Langford avenged that loss in 1912 and beat McVeigh four times on the run. And then in 13, Langford and McVeigh drew. And sort of that was, and they had, a, they had eight more fights to go in their series. They were seven fights deep at that point, but they, um, but McVeigh came back to the U S he won some more fights and he actually, McVeigh had enough left in the tank and did Langford to both beat Harry Wills in 14. And, and it was like, but Wills was getting all this experience and that uppercut you mentioned, there's a, a write up. I can't remember the guy's name that in the fight, I have an article that describes different kind of knockouts of Langford's. And it was an article saying he was the hardest hitter of the generation as had been Bob Fitzsimmons prior. So he was, they were, they were declaring this about Langford, that, you know, not accepting Jack Johnson, like everybody Langford was the hardest hitter, but he, he was, he was maybe getting to the end of his prime here, but he still had enough in to keep a, you know, a great schedule and same with McVeigh and they got the best of Wills, but Wills was now coming in, really coming into his own, so in 15, he does lose to Wills, but then he gets the best of battling Jim Johnson, who had fought, challenged Jack Johnson for the for his title in 13 in Paris. But uh, at the end of that year, yeah, he gets Sam McVeigh in Boston over 12 rounds. Then he gets Sam Langford over 10 rounds. But So he caught them maybe toward the end of their primes, but they were still world-class talent. They were still, you know, keeping winning records other than to each other. They would mix up the results so but then when Wills really got into his full groove, he did have the 19th round knockout loss to Langford, which he felt cost him. He, he basically beat him at the beginning of the year. He said, I was the top contender now. I could get my shot. This would have been Willard. He would have been calling out. Of course, Willard had drawn the line, but he felt he was the top guy. But then he went rematch Langford, and he said that was a mistake. And Langford got him at the end of, the, of a thrilling battle. But then he did bounce in the next fight. They fought a trilogy at the beginning of that year. The first three fights. They also fought later in the year. They fought in April as well. But, you know, by March, they'd fought three times. So Wills had taken two of those three. And then from there on out, other than the, the injury TKO to battling Jim in early 17, Wills was on this just ridiculous run of success. And now he could master McVeigh and Langford and the Joplin ghost Jeff Clark and these other guys and just really show that – and Jeanette. And so he – he didn't get to fight Johnson, but the other three greats of the generation that he emerged into, he was able to take over from them. And that's what we see in these years. That's the important thing to remember is the early setbacks and tough fights and draws against these great fighters, as well as a, some cannon fodder that he could handle to get experience, turned him into this guy who could beat everyone he was fighting. And... uh and so Dempsey had taken the title in 19. Let me rewind the, the graphic here. So the year, you know, Dempsey had fantastic run leading up, two-year run leading up to taking the taking the title from uh, the inactive Jess Willard. But uh, Wills was make, would make an equal case, at least an equal case, to get his own shot. And so when Dempsey won, the natural fight was, look at Harry Wills, look at his 1919. You know, and strip out everyone who isn't epic. You got Sam Langford, Jeff Clark, Sam Langford again, Joe Jeanette, Sam Langford, all in one year. That year, the Dempsey became the champ. So the natural fight is Wills and Dempsey. And the public wanted it. The promoter and Dempsey and his promoter were making excuses. And they just, uh, they, he didn't get the fight, but he still put in the work. Look at his 1920 and 21. Dempsey was a, a great fighter, but he wasn't a particularly busy champion. Harry Wills, what, not all of these were title fights for the color championship, but Harry Wills was an incredibly busy fighter while he was holding that championship. That, cha- that title claim was the best, basically the best colored heavyweight on the planet. He had certainly proven it. And he kept going, but we saw, I mean, you know this, Josh, like later in his career, by 23, he had slowed down his schedule. He was past his prime. He was in his 30s now. 
and you can see, and then eventually, you know, he gets DQ against Sharky, and then Usadun and Castano, like he, he, and then a few, few more fights, and then he, and then he retires. But toward, he was beatable when he was in his mid thirties, mid to late thirties. But until that point, while he was still in his prime, basically for Dempsey's, the significant part of his title reign, or significant, you know, when he was prominent, Wills was the other guy, and he was putting that work in. So, as a separate from the cultural impact that Dempsey had and the impact on paydays, but just strictly in sporting terms, I would rate personally rate Will's career over Dempsey's. I go heavily by schedule. I don't know how you feel about that, Josh. And I'm certainly open to anyone's interpretation of their two careers, two great fighters. But for me, Will's had a tougher schedule. He fought a tougher career and he had tremendous success at that highest level. But um, do you have any thoughts on that as far as, where you would, how you weigh the two careers, because they both had great careers. They both were really good at finishing people. Uh, where, where do you see the balance there as far as just strictly in sporting terms, no cultural impact involved? Yeah, in, in the grand pantheon of the sport in itself, or heavyweights in the sport in itself, uh, I too would rate Harry Wills a bit higher than Dipsy. And of course, this is coming from someone who is a major. Jack Dempsey fan. I've done a lot of videos on Jack Dempsey, and I'm certainly one who just ha has enjoyed diving into his career. I love what he brought to the table, uh, just overall what he meant for the sport, and him being one of those champions that helped to transcend beyond boxing in itself. But certainly, I, I would rate Harry Wills higher knowing all that I I know about what Harry Wills was able to accomplish and then what Dempsey was able to accomplish as well, which, of course, if the heavyweight title in itself is the marker, then, of course, Dempsey, he got that opportunity and he exceeded in passing that test. But it's one that wasn't afforded to Harry Wills for varying reasons. But that being said, take it, if the title is removed from the picture and you just look at it career for career, uh, both of them had great careers. Both of them had some great names and great opponents, but that of Harry Wills just exceeded Dempsey's by a little bit more just because of the fact that he was in with more stellar competition in multiple fights as well. Uh, for a lot of these, so, so we don't have a Jack Dempsey on on uh, Jack, or we don't have a Sam Langford on Jack Dempsey's resume. We don't have Joe Jeanette. We don't have Sam McVeigh, and these are individuals who, at who, while they weren't direct contemporaries, uh, they were in and around at that particular time. Now, of course, they wouldn't have been the top versions of themselves. But that being said, there were likely points where careers could have crossed paths in some capacity. But that being said, I think Will's just had the advantage of being thrown in the mix and having to take on some greater fighters multiple times. And in the case of Jack Dempsey, of course, don't get me wrong, he had to scrap his way to the top and he did take on some tough fighters, uh, but it's just the level of competition for Harry Wills was a, a little bit higher. And I think that there are multiple ways you can view a fighter. Uh, as mentioned, this takes touching away from Dempsey. Uh, he, he is still one of the great icons of the sports, uh, and his level and reach extends far beyond that of, Harry Wills and history has shown such and you really can't tell the story of boxing without a Jack Dempsey. Now, by that same token, you really can't tell Jack Dempsey's story without mentioning Harry Wills. So naturally, Wills deserves to get the recognition that he's been getting and that will always be a question as to what would it what would it have been like if Dempsey fought 
Perry Wills, what would that matchup, how would that matchup would have ended? How would he have handled him? Now, me personally, I think that it's, it's pretty much a fight that could have gone either way. You had some strong suits and traits that favored Dempsey, while you had those that favored Wills. Uh, of course, Wills had been in with the better competition from an overall standpoint uh, around the time that the two would have been ripe and ready, prime for prime, ready to fight. But that being said, Jack Nipsey was no slouch. Uh, any way you slice it, looking at history, and there's a reason he's considered to be one of the bigger punchers that the heavyweight division has seen. Uh, lean, mean machine, as they say. And he got every bit of, uh, every bit an ounce of power out of his 6'1", 190 frame or somewhere there, there around that weight. And he would have made it tough for Harry Wills. And it, and certainly you can conceive ways in which Dipsy could have seen victory as well. Uh, you could do the same with Harry Wills, who was a little bit bigger. Uh, and, of course, he, he, he was probably the stronger of the two. And he, contrary to what the thought may be, he racked up a number of knockouts as well. So both of them were big punchers. We didn't get to see as much of Harry Wills on film, especially in his prime. I don't think we have much of anything of, of him on his or within his prime. We have some where I guess you could say he's sort of in the twilight of his prime, in, per se, when he fought Luis Ferpo, for example. Uh, that would be an example of one sort of in the twilight, but of course we don't have footage of him in his absolute prime. Uh, and ideally, if him and Dempsey would have fought, say, 1920, I think that is probably where you would have seen the best of both fighters in that particular year, uh, because each were certainly in their prime at the time, and each had been wrecking machines to get to that point. And there was nobody else that was going to beat the other except for the two. Uh, so, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, I, I would rate Wills uh, higher. I can conceive varying ways in which he could beat Dempsey. By the same token, I can conceive ways in which Dempsey could potentially beat Wills as well. But, yeah, when we just break it down and look at it at a competition level and, and what the two fighters were able to do with the career that was laid out in front of them, certainly great for both. Uh, but Wills gets that slight edge as far as just some of the fighters he had to go through to be able to stand out in that particular time. And, and I think that's worth noting. And I, and I believe that's probably one of the reasons you as well, random kind of lean towards him in that regard. Yeah. Well put, sir. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, if looking at the various generations in this sort of rich history of the sport, there are lots of matchups that don't happen, sometimes between contemporaries, sometimes when they're both considered right there at the top. And we, we're feeling that today. Although, you know, at the lower weights, sometimes it's easier, but like at heavyweight, it can be pretty tough to get the top guys in there together and everything line up prime versus prime. You know, because then guys get into their 30s and inevitably the injuries pile up. The I think I read today, isn't it Fury needs surgery? Is he going to be out? Is that what's happening now? Now, I may have missed that. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't really caught up with the stories today. But if that is the case, then, uh, yeah, pretty interesting. But I guess it buys them a little bit of time to uh, get prepped for Alexander Usyk. Yeah, I mean, it, the sport has changed. And athletes, because they, they do a run-up to a fight, you know, there's, like, always a long camp. There's always, like, months to get ready for these fights. Unlike back in Will's time, it was it was less common. It certainly happened. Look at Dempsey. He wasn't that busy. But it was less common for athletes to only fight two or three times a year or less. You know, you would – certain guys, lower-level guys, especially if you only have one fight in a year, you practically didn't have a season. You know, look at Dempsey's career leading up, the years leading up to, you know, the t whatever, 24 months roughly leading up to, it, you know, getting the shot. I mean, the guy was busy. Same with, you know, Will's 
by the time that fight was most viable, like 1919 on, or maybe even 18, they could have fought to for contendership. But you know, that would have just been an amazing battle. And I'm not sure how the styles would line up. But uh, you know, I I got distracted earlier. I wanted to mention that uppercut you were talking about from Wills. He may well have got that from his experience against Langford, because one of the knockouts in that article I started to talk about went on rambling, but. He's talking about different knockouts of Langford. One of them, he went for the, it looked like a body shot. Then his head went straight up at him on the point of the jaw with the uppercut. Langford actually leapt off the ground, knocked the guy spark out. But it was, but I've seen footage of, of Wills doing a thing where it's like a body punch. And then he, and then he comes, he rides up the chest, and hits the uppercut. He's doing it in slow motion as a demo in a piece of footage. Mm -hmm. But it reminded me of a tall guy's version of what Langford did. Just like Rocky Marciano kind of did a short arms guy version of what Joe Lewis had done. Style, like if you look at the stance and everything, trying to catch for the backhand, counter and all the different things. But it was a, it was adjusted. And I think a lot of what Wills was doing were his version for his build of what he'd seen in those battles with Jeff Clark in those battles with uh, Jeanette. Three, I think, with Jeanette, the, um, the ones with Sam McVeigh and all these fights with Langford. So. Wills would be a tough out because he'd seen so much at the highest level. But, but as far as who would win the fight, I'm not sure. They were both lethal. It could have, yeah. you know. But uh, certainly, I think I think the the Dempsey in 17 that got knocked out early 17 that got knocked out by Jim Flynn. I don't think that guy was ready to fight 1917 Harry Wills. I think that would have been too soon and not necessarily a even booking. But by 1919, that's probably a 50 50 fight. Mm -hmm. Separate from resume, in terms of resume, Harry Will's resume does dwarf Dempsey's as far as like epic fighters that he fought. But, you know, that's separate from who wins a fight. You know, like if you look at the great Muhammad Ali, you be hard pressed to find a heavyweight resume like that because there, there have only been two, two eras to my mind that are as rich that are that one other era that was that rich. And this was the time of... of you know, Langford, Jeanette, McVeigh, Johnson, and then Wills, Jeff Clark, all these all these badass guys, all fighting a lot. Even because Johnson wasn't a busy champion, but he was busy as hell leading up to that. So, you know, but you look at the great Muhammad Ali, but his resume compared to other people, because Ali got it on. I mean, there's a reason, separate from his cultural impacts, that's a guy to celebrate. He tried to fight everybody. But that doesn't mean he'd necessarily win every matchup in history. Styles make fights. So for me, I guess everyone has their own way to judge greatness. There are lots of great things about Dempsey, great things about Wills. I say Wills has the better resume, strictly sporting terms. But stylistically, as far as a direct head-to-head head -head in prime versus prime, that would be just be an epic fight. And, one, you know, for me, almost like a Sam Langford, Archie Moore at light heavy when, when Langford was still, still under the heavyweight limit of the time. He was walking around around 170, 175, that version of Langford against Archie Moore early in his title reign when he was past his physical prime, but Archie Moore's skills always got better and better and better, mm -hmm. which is why he's an all time great. But I think, uh, yeah, I think it'd be a fantastic matchup and maybe we could do a show on a, mm -hmm. on a fantasy matchup between like really dig into the styles and common op common opponents things like that i'm not sure i know we have coming up it was actually going to be tonight it was going to be the mcveigh langford series folks i apologize for the repeated delays and that that's my fault i just have more research and graphics to do and prepare for to probably do justice to one of the great heavyweight rivalries of all time 15 fights between the guys sam langford and sam mcveigh you know wills fought them both he fought mm -hmm. a who's who right mm-hmm So any any closing thoughts, Josh? Because I'm gonna um, I'm actually doing a Bellator 289 preview with this Friday's Bellator at Mohegan Sun. I'm talking to my man Jay Wolf for hours later on. I gotta finish the last few <laughs> graphics. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, it's been a great discussion. I'll just close saying that yeah, we saw Harry Wills as you touched on. He he reached the highs of highs outside of getting the world heavyweight title championship. And as his career winded down, much like any great fighter, you eventually start to lose a bit of yourself uh, from a physical 
standpoint. And sometimes it could, <clears throat> excuse me, be the case from a mental standpoint as well, especially with uh, outside interests and such. So some of the footage that we do have of Harry Wills is, of course, him uh, taking out or taking on Bartley Madden, I believe, and then Luis Angel Firpo, a fight in which he won uh, and stopped Firpo, if I'm not mistaken. And then the third, and I think one of the only other ones outside of him training was against Faluno Uskadun, the Basque wood chopper. Uh, this was a fight in which Harry Wills, uh, well up there in age and no longer fighting the same type of schedule he had, he was knocked out in this particular fight. And that's kind of one of the lasting impressions we have of him uh, there on film. And that doesn't tell the full story of the fighter, the man, Polino Uskadum, a great contender, been in with a lot of top competition. Harry Wills was past it at that particular time. And he did fight on uh, uh, for an additional like five or six fights. I think he lost one of those. And he eventually wrapped up his career, and he had success outside of the ring in terms of being able to live a comfortable life. So this was in spite of not getting that world heavyweight title shot, but he was able to achieve fame and and some financial gain there within the sport, uh, just regardless of that. And as I opened up with that, some point when we started this series, uh, or maybe in the even the video I created. He somewhere got lost in the shuffle there uh, as history went on, but it's great to see that more and more people know about him now and more becoming more aware of this great fighter, along with a number of the other great fighters from that time who don't quite get the acclaim and recognition because they didn't get the media backing that comes with being a world heavyweight champion. So Harry Wills, definitely uh, check out more of the videos on Harry Wills, you'll get an understanding of how he was able to become the fighter he was and why he was at one point the best heavyweight in the world. Yeah, I think you can certainly, especially if you're judging on proven results, you know, by the time, because Willard was inactive for, what was it, three years, the last three years of his quote yeah. unquote rain, you know, like Wills was getting his groove on, Dempsey was getting his groove on. They were the best two heavyweights in the world before Willard got in there with Dempsey and got schooled. You know, because you have to keep like at this time especially, these guys are well oiled machines, a lot of them. Dempsey was. By the time he fought I think there was a, a pause before between the booking and the actual fight with Willard, but he had fought an insane schedule, tons of finishes. You know, maybe carefully managed to get the right opponents or the, just the right tests. Same thing. Uh, Wills was a little more thrown into the fire, but, you know, not everyone can be a Sam Langford fighting the great Joe Gans 20 months after you debuted as a pro. And you're still a teenager and you're fighting a guy with well over 100 fights, 100 wins, I should say, and like the reigning world champion and all-time great stylist at the end of your first full season. You, not everyone can do that. In fact, almost nobody does that. Or it should, I should say, the people who do that, you don't hear about them because they don't make it. They get thrown into the fire and get absolutely spanked. And it shatters their confidence. Langford is especially hard-headed. He'd had a tough childhood. He'd been out doing manual labor since these early teens, taking care of himself with his fists and his, and, his, and his body to work. So, I mean, Langford is a special example. But from Langford's reign of terror, along with Jeanette McVeigh, largely, um, you know, Wills became the guy and that there, there were fights he didn't get, but he certainly, he certainly did fight some top operators and including not just the hall of famers, but the Joplin ghost, Jeff Clark, Jeff Clark was serious. He would come in, he'd be brought into people's training camps because he was such a great jab remover. He was, he was a real slick fella in the ring. He had some finishes too, but like he was, he was a great mover. He was brought in for, for people's camps after he was, you know, a top fighter. But you can see, like, Wills ran the show. They drew, but then he ran the show. And, and, you know, after the 20 rounds, I think they all finished, right? They drew over 10. Then he beat him over 20 rounds. And then then he just finished him every time they met. That's that's quite a run. That's not even Wills' toughest opponent. But that's a, that's a really powerful fighter he's taken on. Mm -hmm. 
it's like the man got his groove on. So even if there are certain matchups because of the offset of the years or because of politics of the day that we didn't see Wills in, that the people of the time didn't get to see, he still had an awful lot of tough opponents. And some of them, a couple overlap with Dempsey's, you know, but uh, sometimes not at the same time. Dempsey was six years younger. And Wills didn't actually start boxing until I guess he was 22, if I did the math right. But he ended yeah. up fighting a bunch of guys. And he fought big bruiser types like battling Jim Johnson. Then he fought other he fought other guys. He had fought he fought lots of opponents with tremendous amounts of experience. Gumboat Ed Smith. So like he was Wills was in, you know, Jeff Clark's experience and Jeanette's experience and McVeigh and Langford. These he fought a lot of guys who had a whole heap of expertise in, in battles in the ring. Cause the thing about this time was with the schedule, if you weren't good, your body would break down from the damage. So this, the guys that you see with these massive careers, they had the technique and the ring IQ to sustain a schedule. Cause you think about, well, how can a guy get have 16 fights in a year? Well, he's not getting hit. He's finding ways to hit and not get hit. Where the, it, it wasn't quite like today with the larger gloves and it's a little more, well, I don't want to say anything bad about today, but where you see guys punch and they put their guard up. I'll take a couple on the guard. You know, you couldn't do that against a Sam Langford. He would absolutely mutilate your body. You just put it up and be like, I'll just take one in the side of the rabs. No problem. It was a problem. And he could grab a guy. Langford specifically, his arms are so long and he was so low set. He could just grab a guy with one arm and then kidney punch him like he did with Dixie Kid, just until he wilts. Because he was so he was so unusually, but Wills found a way to master that, and you know, so you can say of between Wills and Dempsey. The last thing I'll say, I guess, before we write it off, is that to me, Wills beat one of the all-time great heavyweights, one of the absolute choice guys, the great Sam Langford, a bunch of times. He took over from him, so to me, this Wills is a top ten all-time great heavyweight, and he may not get his his full credit, but you, we do sort of changing, right, Josh? Like the internet and people can step back and look at the information and go, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. It shocked the heck out of me. I didn't know who he was until the boxing librarian and scrapbook box and some of these guys were talking about him on YouTube. And I was like, what the heck? Same thing with Langford, you know? So shout out to BL and shout out to Scrap. And uh, so I guess that's my, my closing rant. But uh, Dempsey was a fantastic fighter and an amazing talent himself. So none of this is to talk him down. This is just to talk up Wills because Dempsey gets his praise. But OK, but what about the guy that Dempsey really should have been fighting? The other the other top heavyweight of the time, arguably the top heavyweight of the time. So that's all I'm going to say, Josh. Thanks so much for coming and thanks, everybody, for listening. Josh, closing thoughts and then we'll just you can sign us out. No, thank you, uh, Random Acoustic Thoughts. Appreciate being able to come and speak on these great fighters. And I know that we'll do more as time goes on. I just released a video of a great Jewish Ukrainian fighter by the name of Kid Kaplan, who was one of the best featherweights to have laced him up, former world featherweight champion, fought a lot of tough and stiff competition. So, that's a story worthy of checking out. Uh, outside of that, of course, random. I look forward to the next one because we're definitely going to have to highlight some additional heavyweights who are part of this major rivalry of fighters. Sam McVeigh, Sam Langford, uh, Joe Jeanette. We've got Harry Wills, Jack Johnson, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, definitely look forward to the next one, buddy. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed this series. There's no official cap on the series, but I, we are going. I believe next, uh, the two of us are going to go into the rivalry between Sam Langford and Sam McVeigh, and it's going to take a whole show, folks, just to get up to their first. They had 15 fights, but we're only going to get to the first two fights because they both fought for years before their first meeting. They both found tremendous success in the ring that led up to their April. 1911 collision in, in Paris and then their subsequent 
you know, part two of the series late, late in the year in Australia as part of their incredible Australian series. So show, show number one will just talk about these two epic careers that lead up to those first two battles. Because the 1911 was insane. It was a silly year for both of them. Also for Joe Jeanette. Jack Johnson wasn't fighting. He held the what had formerly been the white heavyweight title, but Johnson wasn't active that year. They were crazily active. So, you know, and Wills at this point in his career, he didn't factor into their thing in 1911. But this was when all three guys were just in terrifying form, beating a lot of guys and then fighting each other. So we're going to get to the first two fights in the series. It's probably going to take a good while to do that. I'm just still working on the graphics to have something appropriate for the listeners who we greatly appreciate. And um, last thing, the thing I'll close on, Josh, is, you know, when we talk about Langford being past his best, did not mean he wasn't winning a bunch of fights. But we say, okay, so he beat, you know, Langford in, let's see, let me just pull up a year here. All right, so he beat, you know, he beat Langford uh, several times in 17, but look at the rest of Langford's results, you know. Okay, okay, 1918. Again, Wills is able to beat him, but Langford isn't isn't just losing to everyone else. He's not, you know, he's not he's not in his prime because in 17, uh, Fred Fulton mashed his eye up, put him in the hospital, and he, he had nerve damage. So this is now Cycloptic Sam Langford, but he's still winning fights. And look at this in night last one. 1920. Look at that schedule. That's crazy. Langford, there he is in 1920. You can see him right there. It's a little ball of muscle. So, yeah, Wills can beat him, but look, Langford, I think he has 24 fights. He, he only lost like four of them, something like that. So when we say past prime Sam Langford, we're talking about an all-time great past his prime. We're not talking about some regular guy. We're talking about a guy who's cracked so many chins. And just could fight on feel. I mean, he was he, he was he was basically blind when for some of his late career wins. He was fighting on feel. That's how good he was. So, yes, you can say Wills didn't get to fight him that many times. Their primes didn't really overlap. But uh, he was beating a guy who was kicking a whole lot of asses. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Josh. Thanks so much for coming, my friend. Thanks to everyone in the chat. And uh, sorry about all the uh, all the rambling, but this is a great fighter to talk about. Look forward to the series, Josh. Thanks again, brother. Thanks. Take care, everybody.